welcome to worship.
Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome uh, to this service of worship in this space of worship. Those who have gathered in the room, those who are joining us online, it's good to be together, however we can make it happen today. As we come together this World Communion Sunday, I have just a couple of announcements that I'd like to share. Uh, first, in regards to communion, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we will, first of all, we do receive uh, communion here and we celebrate an open table. And that means that if you're here and you want to be closer to Jesus and you look to Jesus for hope and healing, then we invite you to uh, take part. You need not be a member of this congregation in order to receive the sacrament. As we do receive the sacrament, uh, we will invite you to come forward as you are able to do so. Uh, and uh, we're going to start with the musicians first, uh, and then over here where Nicole is on Nicole's side. And basically, if you just think of yourself as coming up this aisle, crossing to receive the bread uh, and the cup, and then going back to your seats, um, we'll just, it'll be a one-way traffic pattern, and you'll figure it out. And by the time it gets to you all, you'll see how it's done. So you just uh, hang on there. Um, I want to give, uh, I mentioned musicians, I want to thank our, our uh, volunteer team. Last week I was so excited, Tony Rollett was going to be here for two weeks, uh, and then uh, he texted me that his mother in England had gotten really ill, so he had to fly to England this week to care for his mom. Uh, so he's not here, but our volunteer team is with us, and we're really grateful for their ability to flex in this way. I have been talking for a couple weeks about the all-church retreat, uh, and I'm here to tell you that if you're not somebody who usually picks up one of those paper bulletins in the back, you ought to do so today because uh, the last page of that paper bulletin uh, is a registration form for the all-church retreat. And uh, as we continue to emerge from uh, the disruption that COVID has brought to us, um, being able to be together at Camp Crestfield will be a good and important thing for us to share. Speaking of emerging uh, from the COVID fog, um, it occurs to me that those who are watching online and even many of you in the room don't always know who our lay readers are because we're still kind of putting the pieces together relationally. So I'm delighted to say that our lay readers this morning uh, are Peter Pross, who is studying for the ministry as a commission ruling elder, uh, and also Jacob Chacon, one of our newest members, having joined uh, as a part of the confirmation class earlier this year. Uh, I think that's all the announcements that I need to make. Is there anything that I'm forgetting? Thank you, Hannah, for those who couldn't hear or are online. Hannah is inviting you all to be a part of the World Mission Initiative uh, Conference on Mission in a Time of Disruption, Friday night and Saturday at the seminary. Uh, and Hannah said if you want to come and hang out with us even more, you can do that because we're both speaking. If you don't really want to hang out with us, you can also watch it online. So you, you don't even have to be with us. Speaking of World Mission uh, and of uh, Worldwide Communion, uh, many of you have met my dear brother in Christ, uh, Silas and Chazana. Uh, and Silas gave me this and this uh, crucifix or this cross, and it's helpful for me to remember that we are one uh, as we move forward in worship. Having said that, uh, I'll invite you to stand, and Jacob will call us into worship.
and the call to worship. We praise God of all nations and peoples. Who are my brothers and sisters? Those who walk in the way of Christ. Who is my family? Those who dwell in God's house. We are many members, but one body. Let's read it together, please. Holy God, 
we confess that we do not always love our neighbor. We confess that we have despised others, even to the point of hatred. We confess that we have been hurt by others. Know that nothing is impossible in you. We come to you seeking healing and wholeness for us. Help us, whenever possible, to live in peace with others, to seek reconciliation and healing and forgiveness. Continuing on. For your son came and lived among us, was betrayed and denied, abused and put to death. He rose again and came with the message of peace to those who have denied him and abandoned him. May we walk in his ways always. Hear the assurance of pardon. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are failing and rises up for all who are bowed down. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. the prayer of illumination God our helper by your Holy Spirit open our minds and lead us into your truth for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord amen the gospel reading is John chapter 10 verses 7 through 10 therefore Jesus said again very truly I tell you I am the gate for the sheep all who have come before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is the word of the Lord. I'd like to ask the children to come forward for a few minutes, please. I like those suspenders, buddy. Good morning. Good morning, friends. Okay. We're going to move around a little bit, but I have a question for you. And I know that some of you, maybe all of you, know the answer to this. If you came to church on like... Um, Tuesday afternoon and you wanted to talk to me do you know where you would look for me in the church over there in my study that's right or my office my study is there but 
let's pretend, here, come with me, okay, come with me, let's pretend that you came to church, okay, you can stop here and look up towards the front, okay, let's pretend that you came to church one Sunday, uh, um, one Tuesday, and the person, maybe it was Mrs. Mack, let's say it was Mrs. Mack said, oh, Dave's in his study, and you'd never been here before. And you said, where's his study? And she said, oh, it's that door in the front of the sanctuary. Well, we have a problem. Let's go back up front. I'll tell you, one day I was in my study and I heard something that was kind of unusual. I was in my study and I heard somebody knocking on the door, but they weren't knocking on the door to my study. I heard something, and somebody was over here. Pastor Dave, Pastor Dave, and then I heard Pastor Dave. There are one, two, three, four. There are five doors in the front of this room. And it didn't take all five before I figured out somebody was looking for me. So I opened up that door and I said, well, <laughs> I've been waiting for you. Come on in. And then the person said, there are a lot of doors in this room. And I said, you're right. And then they said, and some of them are tricky because I don't know. Let's come over here. You might be able to see that door. Go ahead, Levi, open up that door. That door opens, right? That's a, that's a good door. Declan, you can open this door. Rogan, why don't you open this door right here? This door is a fake door. It doesn't even work. There's no hinges. There, it's just a decoration. And there's another fake door over there by where Mr. Steve's guitar is. This was designed by some wacky people, I think. All these doors that don't go anywhere. Let's come back here. So, why am I talking about doors in church and doors that don't go anywhere? Well, because the Bible verse that Jacob just read for us it's right up on there. Jesus says, I tell you, I am the gate. Gate is also another word for door. It means the same thing. I am the gate. I am the door. Jesus is saying that in our world, there are lots of choices. Some of them go to the wrong place. Some of them don't go anywhere. And some of them get us where we need to be. And Jesus says, I'm the one you can count on. I'm the one you can trust. I'm the one who will help you know who you are. So when we think about that, I'm the door, and I think you're going to go back there with uh, Vivian and some of the other friends to talk about the door a little more. Let's think about Jesus as being the one who helps us get to where we are supposed to be. Let's pray. Thank you, God for the way you bring us together. Thank you uh, for your love for us and thank you that you always invite us to come to you and to choose you. Help us to do our best. We pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, friends. I have to say, one of the things that I did not miss at all during the worst time of the pandemic is how quiet it was at the end of a children's sermon. I like having to wait for kids to go back out again. That feels like something right about that. So not long ago, my wife was away for a few days and I was bored. And you might ask, well, how bored were you, Dave? I'm here to tell you that I was so bored that I decided to clean out the closet that housed our tape collection. 
Now, if you're under the age of 25, this does not mean that we have a special place in our house where we keep duct tape, masking tape, electrical tape, painter's tape. I'm talking about the mixtapes that we made in 1970s, about the VHS tapes that we recorded faithfully in the 1980s. I was that bored. And as I was gleefully pitching most of these tapes right into the garbage, I found one in my mother's handwriting that was labeled Christmas with Mom. So I put it into the cassette player. Don't judge me, I have a cassette player. I heard my father's voice announcing to his mother, my grandmother, that the whole family had gathered for Christmas dinner, and as she had moved back to Nebraska, we were missing her that day. And so, in the midst of this bored Saturday morning, 25 minutes or so of family dinner from December 25, 1982. That was the first Christmas that Sharon and I were married. And as I listened, I could picture in the room where we had gathered, I mean, because it was dinner and we always sat at the same chairs every time. And I heard my mother and my sister and my dad, each of whom has already died, talking about other people who had already died. We talked about things that we used to do, like getting up really early on Christmas morning. We talked about things that we still did, like making oyster stew the night before. That tape brought me home again. This morning, we join with the church around the world in celebrating the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Sharing the bread and the cup is the closest thing that we in the Christian family have to family dinner. We are a gathered community coming together. And just like that day 40 years ago, many of us are sitting in the same seats that we always sit in. Maybe we're talking about or thinking about people who aren't with us anymore. Or we're remembering some of the other times when we have shared this space or these elements. And on this World Communion Sunday, I'm thinking about family dinner as we gather to explore the third of Jesus' I Am statements in the Gospel of John. And I hope that you were here or were able to log online to, to read the last two, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world. Oh, those are grand and, and eloquent and sweeping statements of Jesus' identity. And when you hear, I am the bread of the world, I, I, I'm the light of the world. I'm the bread of life. That's like poetry. Those symbols are deep and rich and meaningful. But, but today, I'm the gate. I'm the door. But what is that about? How do we understand something of who Jesus is, who we are called to be, when we hear that Jesus is comparing himself to a gate? I have to say that as a pastor, there is something that I really love about the beginning of John 10. Jacob read for you part of it, but prior to that, the gospel writer starts this episode with the story about a time when Jesus started to spin out a pretty wild metaphor that got out of hand in a hurry. Listen, he begins, very truly, says Jesus, I tell you, anyone who does not enter by the sheepfold by the gate, but comes in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who comes in by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of the stranger. So Jesus starts talking, and there's all these moving pieces here. We have at least a thief, a bandit, a gatekeeper, a shepherd, who knows how many sheep, and the suggestion, if not the presence of strangers, who knows how many. So Jesus runs all this past them, looks around, and says, you get it? And he is met with blank stares, crickets, message failed to send, perhaps. And then verse 6 reads, 
Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. I love that verse. Jesus is saying things that don't make sense to the people to whom he's speaking. That means I can be like Jesus, because that happens to me all the time. It's only after this convoluted story about thieves and gatekeepers and sheep and strangers that Jesus cuts to the chase. He said, look, fellas, it's me. I am the gate. I am the door. So at the end of the day, what do you think that sheep want? They're looking for a place to rest, to gather in safety. Anybody who cares for sheep will provide that for them, albeit in different ways. In the urban areas where towns are well established, the sheep would be led to a fenced structure, a pen, maybe even a, a building like a barn of some kind or another. And upon entering and putting the sheep in there, the shepherd would simply close the door. In more rural areas where the sheep would spend their days grazing out in the open pasture, a shepherd would find a cave or, or a shared space such as you see here or simply construct some sort of a simple enclosure using rocks and branches, anything that happens to be around that would make it inconvenient for the sheep to wander out or for an intruder to find their way in. Then the shepherd would lead the sheep into the opening or even a cave and would lay down and sleep in the doorway, in the entryway. The shepherd would become, in fact, the gate, the access point. Any predator seeking an easy dinner would have to go through the shepherd. Any sheep that might be prone to wandering off would similarly have to step over the same. Can you see that central to this image that Jesus is describing is the idea of being in relationship. Both the shepherd and the sheep count on the fact that they are known and recognized. The gate or the door uh, the, is the means by which those sheep come to know who and whose they are. The function of the structure, whether it's a permanent enclosure in town or a circle of rocks in the wilderness, is the same, to create a sense of home for the sheep. The gate is the means through which those sheep can enter their home. Can I ask what home might mean to you? How do you know where or to whom you belong? Years ago, we were finishing up a youth activity, and a young man stood up, and he stretched, and he said, well, I guess I ought to go to house now. And one of his friends corrected him, and he said, you, you mean home, right? But the first kid said, no, I said what I said. I have a house. There's a building where I keep my clothes. My mother, my sister are usually there, along with some other parade of people who are in and out. I can't keep track of them all. But that building doesn't mean much to me. I don't feel safe there. I don't feel like I belong there. It's not home. It's a house. Where is home to you? How do you know that you are where you belong, with whom you belong? Robert Frost has this wonderful poem, and I hope you'll look it up today. It's called The Death of the Hired Man. And in this poem, we meet Warren and Mary, a rural couple who discover that Silas, this itinerant farmhand who often comes around their neck of the woods looking for work on a seasonal basis, has returned to their home after a prolonged absence, and in fact, after having skipped out early the last time he was there. And Warren is fed up with this farmhand's inconsistency, and he remembers all the other times that Silas has left him hanging after stepping out too soon. But Mary recognizes that something is new this time. Listen, Warren, she said, he has come home to die. You needn't be afraid that he'll leave you this time. Home, he mocked gently. Yes, 
what else but home? It all depends on what you mean by home. Of course, he's, he's nothing to us any more than was the hound that came a stranger to us out on the woods, worn out upon the trail. Warren says, home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. His wife says, I should have called it something you haven't to deserve. Later in the story, the reader discovers that Silas has a brother in town, a well-connected, wealthy man. And yet we understand that Silas came to die at Warren and Mary's home and not at his brother's place. There is a sense of shame and judgment and alienation connected to the brother. And Silas feels safe and secure and welcome at Warren and Mary's place. Silas comes to the home where he knows he will be welcomed, to the place where he is known and valued for who he is. In what ways is Jesus home to you? Are you able to experience his welcome, maybe even here and in this place? Are you able to be your true self here, secure in Jesus' love for you? Every single day, each of us looks for life in some fashion. Often, the things that we think will lead to our joy or our amusement will wind up hurting us or costing us significantly. But Jesus promises us abundant life. Jesus invites us to come into that place that is free of shame or fear, characterized by security and worth and belonging. We are called to walk with him into this place of rest and peace so that we might know the kind of life for which we have always been intended. My friends, I hope, I pray that you know something of this kind of intimacy with belonging to Jesus. I hope that you have found in him and perhaps in relationship with this congregation a sense of security and purpose and welcome and home. Now you may have read in the newsletter uh, that administratively this is the time of the year when we're called to reflect on our membership in the congregation. As we gather around the table that has been set for us this morning, I wonder, do we need to take a step closer? Is it time for you to align your faith and your calendar by becoming a member of this congregation or by volunteering to serve here as a, an officer or in one of the ministries that take place in this place. Or, or maybe your reflection on your sense of connection to this body might provide you with an invitation or an impetus to connect with somebody who is not here now and for you to find a way to invite them to come back home in one way or another. There's something rich and powerful about the image of Jesus as he stretches himself out across that place that is itself an entryway to the place where we have come to find safety and security and rest. And, and yet there's something else for us to consider as we think about Jesus as the gate or the door. It is, of course, of course amazing praiseworthy to think about the fact that he secures a place for us, that he offers us welcome and safety and even definition. But it's clear that sheep were never intended to remain in that enclosure 24-7, 365. Sheep that are held in a pen day in and day out can never know the kind of abundant life that Jesus is talking about in the passage. He's clear. Jesus invites us in. Jesus leads us out. The gate that keeps us safe from prowling bandits who would threaten the safety and security of the sheep inside the enclosure, that's wonderful. And yet the same gate is also the means by which we are freed from the monotony and the drudgery and the stagnation of isolation, of just being our own little selves. Jesus brings us in and nurtures us and protects us and feeds us and then leads us out into the world wherein we are invited to participate in the life that is abundant. The call of the Christ as the gate or the door is not for those 
who would belong to him in order to find a place where we can ha hide out from all the evils of the world. We are not granted some magical place of escape and fantasy wherein everything is perfect. Rather, when Jesus says that he is the gate, he is inviting us into a relationship with himself and with the gathered community, as, as Eugene Peterson would say, the, the community of named individuals who meet in a specific place. And in the context of such rest, identity, and security, then we are able to learn the ways of Jesus so that we can leave the sanctuary and live as his agents to participate in the abundant life of which he speaks. And we do that in the world. As the body of Christ, the church is called to demonstrate first in here and then out there a new quality of life that is shaped by the grace and welcome that comes in and through Jesus. We are, in fact, home in this space and in this relationship. But we are here so that we can be trained in, nurtured for our ability to live in and to live as the love of God in the world that Christ came to save. Thanks be to God for this invitation, for this community, and for this equipping. Amen.
we gather and uh, we remember that uh, we are connected and one of the ways we demonstrate that is by praying together uh, and sharing those things that have connected us in prayer. Uh, I'll remind you that our prayer families for the week this week are the Kistler and the Pearsons family, the Pearson families. I invite you to hold those folks up as you make your daily prayer. Last week, we prayed for Eleanor Arlette, and here she is in what today passes for the front row. So <laughs> it is good. She heard we were having communion today, and she said, I'll be there. <laughs> Good to be with you, Eleanor. Yeah. Want to uh, continue our prayer for those. Uh, I know we've said it a couple times, but uh, there are still folks that are experiencing some pretty rocky places as we enter into this new school year uh, for families, teachers, staff, uh, students. Um, this is a tough year, and so we want to pray for those folks. Last week, I invited you to pray for the Batista family whose son Noah uh, passed away in a motorcycle accident. I spoke with Michelle yesterday, uh, and uh, Noah's dog, their dog, died yesterday uh, uh, after 11 years. And so um, it's just, it just feels like it's piling up on that family. So if you thought about sending them a card and you didn't last week, this would be a great week for you to send a card or to reach out on Facebook or text. Also invite you to pray. Um, uh, I got a call late last night. Um, there's a young boy, his name is Dominic. Uh, Dominic is six years old and he's in life support on ch at Children's Hospital. Uh, and I spoke with his family who are just upset that they can't all get in to see him and to be with him. And so they asked if there was a way that we could pray together. So tonight at 5.30, the family's going to gather in here, and we're just going to have prayer for Dominic. I don't know where you'll be at 5.30, but I would invite you to pray for Dominic and for his family. Dominic's the youngest of four, uh, and he's been in the hospital for so long. His older siblings are kind of bouncing around, and it's, it's just painful and difficult for everybody connected to that situation. So pray uh, for Dominic and for his family. Those are the things that I had written down here. Eleanor, what would you like to add? Thank you, Eleanor. Prayers for Wayne, uh, who has received a diagnosis of cancer and is living into that, uh, and who has marked that by going off on a motorcycle trip with his brothers, his uh, son's grandson, and uh, prayers for that. Sharon. Prayers for a close friend diagnosed with breast cancer and beginning to figure out how to talk about that in the family and to share uh, and live through that. Yeah. Um, I just want to say how much of a joy it is to um, be up here singing and watching um, our daughters with our, our little ones in the back, like worshiping. Um, it was so cute. But like even just to like look out at all of you, it's so wonderful to have all of you here. Um, it's definitely a joy um, that we've missed since COVID, so thank you. Um, and then also, um, prayer for my friend Amy. Um, her colon cancer is just really rough right now, so just keep her in prayer. Prayers for Amy with colon cancer and the joy of children and community. Becky.
You know, you keep talking about how good small groups are, and they don't stay small very long. Um, but we can deal with that. Uh, time of small groups is a joy prior to worship. We had a vibrant women's group this morning. Most of the men's group was in here rehearsing for worship, I think, in view of our volunteer status. But thanks for that. People struggling uh, to care for aging parents. I don't see anything else. Let's continue and lift these things in prayer. Lord, you know uh, that uh, all of these situations, uh, they're not news to you, even as we share them, even as we may have learned a thing or two uh, this day. We know that you are intimately connected. Uh, and we pray, Lord, that you would lift up these folks, that you would uh, be with the folks who are wrapped in grief, uh, who are trapped by some sort of fear, who have been overwhelmed by a diagnosis. We ask uh, for those who are looking at starting every day at work or at school with a sense of confusion uh, or just being spent and worn out. We pray, Lord, that you would bring a sense of home, of security, of safety to us that we might carry with us as we walk through the day into each of these appointed places. We give you thanks for the chance that we have to encourage and be encouraged by one another. And we ask that you would help us to function ever more faithfully as the body which is always connected, which is always reaching out which is always wrapped in, known by, defined as love. We pray that we would be uh, as open to the world around us as you have been to us. We pray, Lord, that you would walk with us uh, as we enter into this week and that you would equip us in the sacrament that we will receive shortly uh, to be, to no be known as and to be holding on to our identity as yours. In the name of Jesus, we pray these and all our unspoken prayers. Amen. Uh, sisters and brothers, uh, hear the invitation to the offering. In joyful noises and hymns of praise, we sing out our gratitude for the gift of life, for companionship along life's pathways, for the covenant that draws us together in faith and service. Empower us once more to stand against evil as we explore the heights and depths of possibilities you offer for us. Dwell in us so Jesus Christ may be revealed in our deeds and words. Amen. <laughs> prayer of dedication. Generous God, you have given us life, a place to live in, and people to live with. Open our eyes to each other and to all our brothers and sisters, especially the poor, the oppressed, the alienated. Make us humble enough to help and comfort them so that your love and justice and peace may come to them. We make bold to consecrate ourselves and our gifts to you and to the service of others. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Beloved, again, as we gather to receive the Lord's Supper, just a couple of announcements. Uh, I want to remind you that um, 
we have uh, some gluten-free option up here. If you need that, talk to Erlina May. When you get here, she'll direct you to the gluten-free bread. Uh, also, if um, you are immunocompromised or would prefer not to have uh, the bread that's on the common plate, we have those little peel-off coffee creamer things that have what you need in them. Uh, and again, we, were, we would celebrate an open table. He was always the guest in the homes of Peter and Ju Jairus, Martha and Mary. He was always the guest. At the homes of the wealthy, at the, where he pled for the cause of the poor, he was always the guest of setting polite company, befriending isolating people, welcoming the stranger. He was always the guest, but here at this table, he is the host. Those who wish to serve him must first be served by him. Those who want to follow him must first be fed by him. Those who would wash his feet must first let him make them clean. For this is the table where God intends us to be nourished. This is the time when Christ can make us new. So come, you who hunger and thirst for a deeper faith, for a better life, for a fairer and more just world. Jesus Christ, who has sat at our tables, now invites us to be the guests at him, at his. So come to this table, you who have much, and you who would like to have more, and you who have been to this sacrament often, and you who have not been for a long time, you who have tried to follow Jesus, and you who have failed, come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here at his table. Let us remain seated for this song. Beloved, let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Holy God, you have always been for us. You have always been with us. We thank you for commanding light to come from the darkness, for dividing water from the sea into dry land, for creating the whole world and calling it good. We thank you that you have made us your children in your image, to live with each other in love, for the breath of life and the gift of speech and the freedom to choose your way. 
You told us your purpose in your commandments to Moses. You called for justice in the cry of the prophets. Through long generations, you have been fair and kind to your children. Your works are great and wonderful, Lord God Almighty. Your ways are just and true. And so with people of faith from every time and every place, we lift our hearts in joyful praise. For you alone are holy. Holy, holy, holy God, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And we thank you, God, for your son, Jesus, who lived with us and shared our joy and sorrow. He told your story. He lived your truth. He healed the sick. He was a friend of sinners. And obeying you, he took up his cross and he was murdered by people that he loved. We praise you that Christ is not dead, but is risen to rule the world. And we are so grateful that he is still the friend of sinners. We trust in him to overcome every power to hurt or divide us so that when you bring in your promised kingdom, we will celebrate the victory with him. Remembering the Lord Jesus, we break this bread and we share one cup, announcing his death for the sin of the world and telling his resurrection to all people, to every nation. God who called us from death to life, we give ourselves to you and with the church to all ages. We thank you for your saving love in Jesus Christ, our Lord, as we pray together the prayer that he has given us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal and arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this and remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this is the blood, this is my own blood, which is poured out for you in the new covenant. As often as you drink this, remember me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
Friends, hear the uh, prayer of dedication. Loving God, you have given us a share in the one bread and the one cup and made us one with Christ. Help us to bring your salvation and joy to all the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
So this is the 32nd year I've been sharing the Lord's Supper, and this is the first time that the blood of Christ has actually been poured out. Um, it is a reminder that sometimes the ideas and the believing is easy, but church is messy, and community can be messy, and yet it is good, and it is right, and it is that which gives us meaning and purpose. So, beloved, go out into the world in peace and have courage. Hold on to that which is good and return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help those who suffer and honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. And I hope the whole church will say, Amen. <laughs>